You're listening ad-free on Amazon Music. In January of 1990, 39-year-old Marlene Warren made her way across her sprawling backyard in Wellington, Florida. Marlene and her husband Michael were hosting a barbecue for some of their friends and family and co-workers. And so far, the Florida winter weather had not disappointed. It was sunny and about 75 degrees Fahrenheit, so a perfect day for an outdoor party. Marlene looked down and checked the food on the grill. It smelled delicious and was almost ready to be served. Then she looked up and saw all the people in her yard who were talking and laughing and having a great time, and she smiled. Her backyard, and really her entire house, were made for big parties like this one. Where Marlene lived, Wellington, Florida, was a small upscale village not far from West Palm Beach that was filled with mansions and golf courses. Marlene and Michael's five-bedroom home was over 5,000 square feet, it had a pool, and it even had an attached airplane hangar for Michael's prop plane. Marlene enjoyed the luxury that her house and her neighborhood provided, but really what she loved the most was all the space she had on her property so she could throw these big parties for all the people she loved. The smell of the food drifted across the backyard, and after a while, a few guests began heading towards the grill. And amongst those guests were a young couple, Sheila and Richard Keen, who walked up and asked Marlene if she needed any help. But Marlene said she had everything under control, and really she was just happy that Sheila and Richard had made it to the party. Sheila and Richard both worked for Marlene's husband, Michael, at the used car dealership that he owned, and so Marlene was just happy to meet some of these people that spent so much time with her husband. Sheila and Richard chatted for a little bit longer, and then they turned and headed back towards the party, at which point Marlene began taking the food off the grill and putting them out on serving dishes. As soon as Marlene's 21-year-old son, Joey, and a few of his friends saw Marlene putting the food out, they rushed over and grabbed some paper plates and began piling them full of food. Joey's father, Marlene's husband, Michael, spotted the boys doing what they were doing, and he laughed and told them to please save some food for the other guests. Then Michael walked over to the grill and put his arm around Marlene, and she leaned her head on his shoulder. Both of them had been so busy with work lately that it felt like they barely got any time together. So it was nice now to have a moment to relax together and just to enjoy the company of their friends and family. Marlene and Michael had been together for almost 18 years. And even though things weren't always perfect, Marlene couldn't imagine her life without her husband. Back in the mid-1960s, Marlene had gotten married to a different man. She gave birth to her first son at the age of 16, and she had Joey a few years later when she was 19. But not long after that, her first husband had died, and Marlene felt completely lost. She was now a widow at just 20 years old, and she was trying to raise two young boys all on her own. At the time, she had gotten a lot of support from her parents, but there were still moments when she just felt like surviving was almost impossible. Then she had met Michael, and it was like everything in her life got better. Michael was kind, he was handsome, he was driven to succeed, and he almost immediately became this loving father figure to Marlene's two boys. And Michael was just as taken with Marlene as she was with him. He thought she was absolutely stunning with her beautiful red hair and blue eyes. But more importantly, he thought of Marlene as being a really strong person who had managed to overcome this terrible tragedy, you know, losing her first husband at such a young age. And so clearly Marlene was just this really mature person. And also Michael really liked how driven Marlene was to succeed just like he was. Marlene and Michael had gotten married in 1972 and they eventually moved to Florida. They started a real estate business that Marlene ran, and over the years, they had come to own multiple rental properties. Michael had also opened up a used car dealership that specialized in selling and renting cars to people who struggled to get loans because of their credit. And ultimately, both the real estate and car business had taken off in ways that not even Marlene and Michael had seen coming. And so they ended up making millions and millions of dollars between them and then buying their beautiful home here in Wellington. In the backyard, Marlene and Michael stepped away from the grill and mingled with their guests. Marlene said she was glad people from different aspects of their life, friends, family, and work, all seemed to be getting along so well. Then Marlene and Michael split up to cover more ground and to see if any of their guests needed anything. A little while later, Marlene went back to the grill to cook more food, and her mother-in-law approached her. Marlene had a great relationship with Michael's mom, and they always had plenty to talk about, but her mother-in-law had a serious look on her face so Marlene asked if everything was okay. Her mother-in-law leaned in, like she was about to tell Marlene some big secret. Then she just pointed towards some of Michael's employees, Sheila and Richard Keene, the two that Marlene had spoken to at the grill earlier, and in a quiet voice, she told Marlene to watch out for Sheila because she was young and pretty. 
Marlene understood that her mother-in-law was just trying to help. They both knew Michael could be a bit of a flirt, but Marlene wasn't too worried about anything like that. And so she ended up not really saying anything back to her mother-in-law after she made this comment. But inside, if she was going to worry about either of the Keens, it would not be Sheila, it would be Richard. Richard had a bit of a shady past. He'd faced weapons possession and drug charges with the police, and he worked for Michael as a repo man, which meant he took cars back from people when they were behind on payments. It was a difficult job, and a lot of people did not want to give up their cars, but Richard was known as a tough guy who people did not want to mess with, and so no matter how much people fought him, he would get them to give up their cars. Still, Marlene was not about to hold anybody's past against them. She knew Richard was one of Michael's hardest working employees, and the two men, Michael and Richard, really seemed to get along well. So if Marlene's husband trusted him, then she did too. The party lasted into the night, and by the time the final guests left, Marlene felt exhausted but really happy. The barbecue had clearly been a success. Inside the house, she and Michael sat down on the couch and put their feet up. Michael looked over at his wife and said, Hey, pretty soon we're going to have to start thinking about our next party, your 40th birthday. Marlene laughed because her 40th birthday was still almost five months away. But Michael said it was never too early to start thinking about it. After all, turning 40 was kind of a big deal. Marlene and Michael sat and talked a bit longer. Then Michael said he was tired and kissed his wife and headed to bed. Marlene stayed in the living room by herself. And as she sat there, it really hit her that she was going to turn 40 soon. Now, there was a time when she would have seen that as getting old, and she would have dreaded the birthday, but Marlene actually felt kind of excited for her birthday. For her age, she had actually accomplished a ton. You know, she had the kind of life that people envied, and she believed that everything would just keep on getting better as she got older. About six months later, at around 11 a.m. on Saturday, May 26th, 1990, Marlene was cooking food again. This time, though, she was in the kitchen making breakfast for her son Joey and two of his friends who were over at the house. Marlene finished up the food and then hollered for the boys to come and get it. Joey and his two friends rushed into the kitchen, they got their breakfast, and then went back into the living room to keep watching TV. Marlene was happy to have a relaxing weekend ahead of her. A little bit earlier, Michael had headed out to a racetrack in Miami with a friend about 70 miles away, so Marlene was totally solo and she figured she might just spend the day driving around. Michael had surprised her for her 40th birthday with her dream car, a candy apple red Firebird. Marlene loved this sports car, and today felt like the perfect day to go out for a drive. But before she could head outside to hop in her car, the doorbell rang. Marlene was pretty sure her son and his friends were not going to get up to answer the door, so she headed to the front door and she opened it up. And as soon as she did, Marlene smiled because standing there was a clown. It was this person in a clown costume with a curly red wig and white makeup, and this clown was holding balloons and a small picnic basket filled with flowers in one of their hands. At this point, Joey and his friends looked up from the couch towards the door, and when they saw the clown, they just started laughing. They wondered why there was a clown at the house, but they quickly turned back to the TV. As for Marlene, she figured these balloons and flowers must be some sort of late birthday present, or just a kind of random nice surprise from Michael. The clown grinned and handed the balloons and flowers to Marlene. Marlene said, oh, these are so pretty, and then began looking for a card to see who had sent this to her. But as she did this, Marlene didn't notice the clown pulled their other hand out from behind their back. And then a second later, in the living room, Marlene's son Joey suddenly heard a loud pop, and then he turned and looked towards the front door, and he saw the clown had turned and begun running away from the house, and his mother was now lying on the floor. Joey and his friends had no idea what just happened, but they ran over to Marlene's side, and right away they saw her face was covered in blood. She had been shot. The boys ran out the door screaming for this clown and screaming for help, and then at the end of the road, they saw a white Chrysler sedan called a LeBaron racing away around the corner. And so one of Joey's friends rushed back inside to call 911. Joey ran straight for his car. He hopped inside and began flying down the road after this Chrysler. But Joey, after turning the corner and driving all around the neighborhood, he could not find the white Chrysler LeBaron. It was gone. Not long after the 911 call, Detective Michael Harrison of the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department arrived outside of Marlene's house. 
When Harrison had first gotten the call to investigate a shooting carried out by a clown in one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the county, he wondered if he was hearing everything right, or if maybe a fellow officer was playing some sort of twisted joke on him. But Harrison quickly realized this was not a joke. After being shot, Marlene had been rushed to the hospital, and she was now fighting for her life. All Harrison knew about the person who had shot her was that they were last seen wearing a clown costume. Harrison walked towards Marlene's property. Officers who had arrived first on the scene had already cordoned off the yard with police tape, and out front, they had gathered Joey, his two friends, and a neighbor who had heard the shooting while he was out walking his dog. Joey and his friends stood there with police, still in total shock. Joey's hands trembled, and the first thing he told Detective Harrison was that he'd gone after the shooter, but he had failed to catch them. Harrison did his best to calm Joey down. He knew this young man really just wanted to go to the hospital to see his mom, and Harrison also knew that the chaos of what had just happened would just make it really difficult for Joey to focus. But Joey and his friends were Harrison's best witnesses, and so he hoped he could get at least some information out of them right now. So Harrison asked Joey if there was anything he remembered about the shooter beyond them being dressed as a clown. After taking a deep breath and collecting himself, Joey would say that the shooter had a lot of white makeup on, like even more makeup than a circus clown would wear, so as a result, it was almost impossible to tell what the shooter actually looked like. But Joey said, you know, as far as he could tell, the shooter was a man who was probably about 5 foot 9 inches tall, and he had what looked like really big hands. Joey's friends would agree with that description. Detective Harrison said this was extremely helpful, and then he asked them if there was anything else they remembered. Joey just shook his head, and his friends said that was all they could think of. But then, Joey looked up at Harrison like something had just come back to him. He said there actually was one thing that really stood out, but he hadn't really thought about it at the time. Joey said when the clown came to the door, there was a part of his costume that seemed a bit off. Instead of wearing the typical oversized clown shoes, this clown was wearing black combat boots. This was an interesting piece of information, but it didn't really surprise Harrison. The detective figured the shooter had planned this whole shooting out, and they knew they would need to make a quick getaway, and trying to run back to their car in giant clown shoes would have been very difficult. Harrison thanked Joey and his friends for their help, and as they walked away, Harrison just could not imagine what Joey must have felt witnessing his mother get shot like that right in front of him. Harrison walked over to the neighbor who had been out walking his dog at the time of the shooting. The man would tell Harrison that he only heard a single gunshot, he also said he was sure the shooter had sped off in a white Chrysler LeBaron that didn't have a license plate. Harrison thanked the neighbor, and then he made one of the weirdest phone calls he'd ever made in his entire law enforcement career. He contacted the sheriff's department and asked them to issue a BOLO, which is a be-on-the-lookout message to other law enforcement agencies and the general public. Harrison said the BOLO should let people know they were searching for a white Chrysler LeBaron that was being driven by a clown. Harrison made his way inside of Marlene's house, and right away he was stunned at just how little evidence there was, considering a shooting had taken place right there. There was very minimal blood in the entryway, and there were no bullet casings, no weapon, and no bullet holes in the wall. Harrison still needed to get some information from the hospital where Marlene had been taken, but based on his conversation with the neighbor, and also based on what he saw at the crime scene, Harrison's first impression of this crime was that the clown, the shooter, fired one bullet, and that bullet must be lodged somewhere in Marlene's body. The lack of ballistics evidence, and the fact that the shooter was fully disguised, meant that Harrison and his team did not have a lot to go on. But he crouched down in the entryway and focused on the evidence he did have, the balloons and the basket of flowers. One of the balloons was pretty generic, but the other one was red, heart-shaped, and had a message on it that said, You're the greatest. For now, that balloon was the best clue Harrison had. So he instructed his team to cover every place in the area that sold balloons to see which of those places sold heart-shaped balloons like the one left behind at the scene. Harrison's team worked fast, and his tactic paid off. Later that day, he learned there was only one grocery store in town that sold that particular balloon. So Harrison had his first major break in his search for the clown who had shot Marlene. Members of the investigative team went to the grocery store where they believed the balloon left at Marlene's house had come from. And one of the clerks there remembered selling the balloon and flowers to someone about an hour and a half before Marlene was shot. 
Now, the clerk could not provide a description of the person who bought these items, but this information was still very valuable because now Detective Harrison thought there was a strong possibility that their shooter, the clown, was somebody local, that they would have known to come to this particular grocery store to get that particular balloon and those flowers. And so with that theory in mind, that their shooter was local, Harrison turned his attention to local costume shops. If the shooter purchased the balloons and flowers in town, then they very likely got their clown costume locally too. And later that day, a bell jangled over Harrison's head when he walked through the door of a small, dimly lit costume shop. He walked past shelves of masks and racks filled with all different kinds of costumes, and at the back of the shop, he found two young women sitting behind a large glass counter that had costume makeup displayed in it. Harrison introduced himself to the young women, and they were clearly very surprised to see a detective in their store. Harrison told them they had nothing to worry about and that he just had a couple of basic questions for them. Then he asked both of them if they were called selling a clown costume recently. The women looked at each other and their eyes went wide. Then one of the young women turned back to Harrison and told him they'd actually just been talking about a clown costume that they had sold a couple of nights earlier. She said the costume itself was not the weird part. It was the customer who bought it that made the whole transaction so strange. She said this customer had come into the shop while they were locking up for the night, and so the women had told this customer they were closed, but this person said they were desperate to get a clown costume, and they had to have it right now. The young women could tell this customer seemed very, very anxious and on edge, and so ultimately they decided to help. They walked the customer to the back of the store and showed them the clown costumes they had, and eventually the customer found the costume they liked, and they also bought a red curly wig, a clown nose, and a bunch of white makeup. Harrison asked if this customer had also bought clown shoes, and one of the women said actually that was another interesting thing about this transaction. The customer had been so adamant that they wanted a full clown costume, but then when it was time to actually get the clown costume, they said they did not want the shoes that came with it. So Harrison asked for a description of this customer. But both women said, you know, it was the strangest thing. When this customer came in, it was like they already were in disguise because they had a hat pulled down over their face and they had their jacket pulled up high around their neck and they kept looking down and barely speaking. And so, you know, the two women just did not have a clue what this person looked like. They couldn't really even tell if it was a man or a woman. But what they could recall was that this person was maybe five foot eight or five foot nine and they appeared to have some brown hair, but they didn't know how long it was. While this description obviously was not very helpful, it did kind of match the description that Marlene's son, Joey, had given of the clown that shot his mother. You know, he basically described an average-sized man, and that seemed like that's what the customer was. Harrison hoped this customer had bought the clown stuff using a credit card, and then he could just kind of follow the credit card transaction history right to the shooter. But unfortunately, when he asked the women for the credit card receipt, they said that the customer had paid in cash, and so there was no paper trail. So Harrison thanked the two young women for their time, and then he headed back outside and made his way back to the sheriff's department. The next day, so May 27, 1990, the day after the shooting, Detective Harrison led Marlene's husband, Michael, into a small office at the sheriff's station. Michael looked dazed and like he hadn't slept in a long time. The day before, Michael had been halfway to Miami when he got a call on his car phone. That was how he had learned his wife had been shot. Michael had turned around immediately and sped to the hospital to be with Marlene, and he had stayed with Marlene the entire time until Harrison had asked him to come to the sheriff's station. Harrison sat down across from Michael. The detective knew Michael had an airtight alibi, having been on the road when the shooting took place, but when a violent crime is committed, spouses are often the first suspect. So even if Michael didn't pull the trigger, Harrison could not yet rule out that he was involved in some way. And even if Michael wasn't connected to the shooting, Harrison hoped Michael could provide some key information that might push the investigation forward. Harrison asked Michael if he had any idea who would want to hurt his wife. But Michael looked like he barely even heard the question. He just said he wished the shooter had gotten him instead of Marlene. He said she was such a good person and everybody loved her. Detective Harrison said he understood how hard this was for Michael, but he asked the question again. Did he know of anybody who might want to hurt his wife? Michael finally slumped over and he rubbed his eyes. He took a minute to either think or collect himself, and then he looked back up at Harrison, 
Michael said the only thing he could think of had to do with his and Marlene's real estate business. They had several rental properties, and periodically they would have to evict people from these properties. And because Marlene managed the real estate business, she was the one who handled these evictions. And people who get evicted don't like being evicted. There's lots of opportunity for conflict. So Michael thought it was possible that maybe an angry former tenant who had been evicted by Marlene had attacked Marlene to get some kind of revenge on her for getting kicked out of their apartment. That made sense to Harrison, and so he made a note to have his team look into all the people Marlene had evicted over the years. Then he asked Michael if he and his wife had been fighting recently or if their marriage was strained in any way. Michael said he would do anything for his wife and vice versa. He said sure, they argued like any married couple did, but it was usually just over small stuff, and they always made up and they loved each other. Then Michael told Harrison that what he really wanted right now was just to be back at the hospital with his wife. Harrison nodded and thanked Michael for coming to the station and then let him leave to go back to his wife. Later that day, members of Harrison's team started tracking down the names and locations of the people who Marlene had evicted and who might, because of that eviction, have a grudge against her. And Detective Harrison reached out to Marlene's friends and family to see if they might know something that Michael was unaware of or forgot to mention. And in doing that, Harrison got one piece of information that completely threw him for a loop. Apparently, Marlene loved clowns. Marlene's parents told Harrison that when Marlene was little, she had clown decorations all over her room and she was always drawing pictures of clowns. And they said this love of clowns did not go away when Marlene got older. She would still get very excited if she saw a clown or if she heard the circus was in town. And so Detective Harrison still thought looking into disgruntled former tenants made a lot of sense. But this new information sparked a different idea about the case for him. Had someone who knew Marlene really well tried to kill her dressed up as the one thing that she loved? Who would do that? It's so dark and twisted. The following day, so May 28th, two days after the shooting, Marlene's family made the heartbreaking decision to take Marlene off of life support. And so Marlene passed away in the hospital. It was Memorial Day, and Marlene's son, Joey, knew it was the kind of holiday that his mom would have loved to celebrate by hosting another big backyard barbecue for her friends and family. Joey had held on to hope that his mom would survive this ordeal, but now that she was gone, Joey just felt lost. The family dealt with the shock of losing a wife, mother, and child, and at the same time, Detective Harrison now knew he had a homicide case on his hands. But at least he felt like he had a few decent leads. For example, his team was able to locate all the people Marlene had evicted, so Harrison pursued the idea that this could have been a grudge killing. But Harrison found himself feeling more surprised after he spoke to each of these evicted former tenants. Even though Marlene had kicked them out of their apartments, they all still spoke very fondly of her. They said she was a genuinely good person and a decent landlord. Some said they had even remained friends with Marlene after they had been evicted. Harrison couldn't actually rule any of them out yet, but during all those interviews with these former tenants, he never felt like he was talking to a killer. Then on May 30th, so four days after the shooting, Harrison got a major break in the case. The white Chrysler LeBaron car, the car the clown had jumped into and sped off in that Joey had chased after and couldn't find, well, that car was found. A little after 9.30 a.m., Detective Harrison and county forensics investigators arrived at a grocery store parking lot where the car had been abandoned. The car didn't have any license plates on it, so instead, Harrison called in the vehicle identification number, or VIN number, that's assigned to every vehicle, and you can find it typically on the inside of your car door. He called that number in to his department so they could begin to try to look it up, at the same time that the forensics team began to comb through this car to look for evidence. And at some point, one of the forensics investigators who was in the driver's side of the car called out to Harrison, and so Harrison walked over to the driver's door, and the investigator pointed out red fibers on the door, and then showed Harrison that more of those same red fibers had been found in the driver's seat. They would need to run tests to confirm this, but everybody at the scene felt confident those red fibers must have come from the red clown wig the shooter was seen wearing. The forensics investigators continued their sweep of the car, and they would also find two strands of brown hair. They bagged the red fibers and brown hair as evidence, and then prepared them to be sent off to an FBI crime lab to be analyzed. 
At the time, DNA testing was still in its early days, and so hair analysis was also very limited. The FBI had greater testing capabilities than the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department, but Harrison knew there was still no guarantee that these hair samples would actually lead him anywhere. Still, they had a car that matched the description of the one that had been seen speeding away from the crime scene, and they had red fibers that could match the description of the red clown wig, and Harrison believed the shooter had brown hair based on the description he'd gotten from the two young women at the costume shop, and they had those brown hairs that were found in the car. So it seemed clear to Harrison that they had found the shooter's car, and he wouldn't have to wait for the FBI's test results to find a connection between that car and the victim. Police ran that vehicle identification number, and they discovered that the LeBaron was a rental car. And about a month earlier, it had been returned to the used car dealership that Marlene's husband, Michael, owned. Harrison left the grocery store parking lot and quickly went back to the station. But when he arrived, he discovered that the story surrounding the LeBaron was a lot stranger than he'd imagined. It would turn out the LeBaron had not originally been rented from Michael's company. Instead, the couple who had rented this LeBaron had apparently accidentally called Michael's company and asked where they should drop the car off when they returned it. And somebody at Michael's company, who was used to cars getting returned all the time, and so did not think to ask this couple, hey, did you rent with us or did you rent somewhere else? They just told the couple, okay, yeah, just leave the car at this specific location and leave the keys inside. Harrison didn't know what to make of this. He thought it would have been a lot more cut and dry if the car simply belonged to Michael's company, but now he needed to figure out if this was all just some bizarre coincidence that, you know, the killers happened to drop off the car at Michael's company by accident, or if Michael, or one of his employees for that matter, had taken this opportunity to get a hold of a car that they thought would not be traced back to them. So Harrison went to interview some of Michael's employees, and he thought he found another potential suspect when he spoke to Sheila and Richard Keene the young couple who had been at Marlene's barbecue, who had walked up to Marlene when she was at the grill and they had asked her if she was doing okay. Also the same couple that Marlene's mother-in-law had sort of warned Marlene about, saying that, you know, Sheila was young and pretty, so be cautious of her. But Marlene was actually thinking, you know, Sheila's not the problem, it's Richard. You know, he's this big, intimidating repo man guy. Harrison and his team dug in to Sheila and Richard's background and they would discover that Richard had a criminal record. And in virtue of him being a repo man who worked all over the area, he would know his way around the neighborhood, and he could have easily figured out a route to quickly escape Marlene's neighborhood, and he probably would have had a good idea where to abandon the getaway car, where it wouldn't be found for at least a few days. But after actually meeting with Richard, Harrison couldn't find anything linking him directly to Marlene's shooting. And there was no evidence that Richard was the employee at Michael's company who had taken that call about returning the LeBaron and then told the renters where to leave it. So, over the next couple of weeks, Harrison continued to pursue leads connected to Michael and his business, but he started to feel like the answers to this case were just out of his grasp. He had a strong hunch that either Michael or someone who worked for him was behind the shooting, but the evidence just wasn't coming together and news from the FBI did very little to point Harrison in the right direction. Test results did show that the red fibers found in the LeBaron were most likely from a wig, but the two strands of brown hair that investigators had also found could not be analyzed fully enough to identify who they belonged to. And so after all this work that Harrison and his team had done, they still basically had very little to go on. So Harrison decided to keep digging into Michael's used car dealership because he still thought the abandoned white LeBaron was the strongest clue they had. Detective Harrison and his team spent the months following Marlene's murder delving into her husband Michael's business practices at his used car dealership, and they found significant evidence of illegal activity. Now, it was nothing that tied Michael or any of his employees to Marlene's murder, but still there was way too much evidence of these other crimes for Harrison to just overlook. So on October 26th, 1990, exactly five months after Marlene's murder, Michael was arrested on multiple charges, including racketeering, auto theft, and filing false insurance claims. Michael's attorney argued that the only reason police made the arrest was because they were frustrated with their own inability to find Marlene's killer. Michael would eventually be sentenced to four years in prison, but during all that time, Detective Harrison did not get any closer to identifying the person who had murdered Marlene. Harrison had a strong hunch about who he thought had done it, 
but he didn't have the clear-cut evidence to back it up. And as more time went by, stories of the killer clown in the upscale Florida neighborhood seemed more like a strange urban legend than an active, actual homicide investigation. And eventually, the killer clown case went cold, and it would stay that way for decades. But 23 years after Marlene's murder, so in 2013, the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Department received a federal grant of $125,000. The grant money was to be used to help solve cold cases, and one of the very first cold cases the department reopened was Marlene's murder. The new investigators started by reviewing all of the evidence and putting the case back together piece by piece. They located and re-interviewed past suspects and witnesses, and they also tracked down Marlene's husband, Michael, who was now living in Tennessee with his new wife, a blonde woman named Debbie. But early on in the new investigation, police still could not find any evidence that pointed them in the right direction. But like Detective Harrison before them, the new investigative team could not shake the connection between Michael's used car dealership and the white Chrysler LeBaron that the clown had used as a getaway car. And they were convinced if they kept looking into that connection, they would eventually discover something that would pay off. It took a few more years, but they were right. Their method did finally pay off. In December of 2016, so over 26 years after Marlene's murder, detectives from the Palm Beach Sheriff's Department traveled to Tennessee and they would follow local police to an establishment called the Purple Cow, a fast food burger place that Michael and his new wife Debbie owned. The investigators spoke to current employees about the couple and everybody talked about what incredible bosses Michael and Debbie were and what a great place the Purple Cow was to work. So the detectives left the fast food restaurant and met up with former employees of the Purple Cow, thinking maybe they would be more candid about their experience with Michael and Debbie. And inside of a small house in Tennessee, the Florida investigators met with a former Purple Cow employee who said he had all the details from an insane conversation Michael's new wife, Debbie, had had with a friend of his. The information this former employee provided about this drunken conversation led investigators to dig through photos that had been taken at the Purple Cow. And one of those photos leapt out at the investigators, and they were sure they had finally found proof of who killed Marlene. Still, investigators were not willing to put an entire case on the line with a single photograph, especially for a case that dated back almost 27 years. They wanted scientific evidence to back up their claims. So they reached out to the FBI. DNA testing and hair analysis had taken massive leaps forward since Detective Harrison's initial investigation into this case back in 1990. And so this time, when the FBI tested the two strands of brown hair that had been found inside of the abandoned white Chrysler LeBaron, they were able to find a clear match. And the person those tests pointed to was the same person investigators had seen in the purple cow photo. And that person was Marlene's killer. Based on those DNA tests, the infamous purple cow photo, and evidence collected across 27 years, here is a reconstruction of what investigators believe happened to Marlene Warren on the morning she was killed, May 26th, 1990. On that day, so May 26th, the killer dipped a small triangle-shaped sponge into a container of clown makeup. The killer then ran the sponge across their face over and over again, painting their face white. The process took a while, but they wanted to be sure that any of their recognizable facial features disappeared under all their makeup. When they were satisfied with the makeup, the killer took a clean sponge, dipped it in red makeup, and gave themselves big red dots on their cheeks and also a wide red smile. The killer fitted a red curly wig on their head and tucked their brown hair underneath it. Then they added the final touch, a clown nose. The killer then looked in the mirror. They were sure nobody would know who they were. Finally, they picked up two balloons and a basket of flowers off the floor, they grabbed their 38 caliber handgun off the makeup table, and they headed out the door. At around 11 a.m., the killer clown drove a white Chrysler LeBaron past the mansions in Marlene's neighborhood. The killer was nervous, but they told themselves they had the perfect disguise, so there was nothing to worry about. The killer eventually pulled up in front of Marlene's house. There was a car that was already on the long circular driveway, so the killer parked the LeBaron on the street. The killer glanced in the rearview mirror just to make sure their costume and wig were all in place. Then they stepped out of the car and they opened up the back driver's side door, 
They reached inside and grabbed the balloons and flowers in one hand, and they grabbed the gun with the other. The killer clown then walked up the driveway towards the front door, hiding the gun behind the basket of flowers. The clown stepped onto the porch and slipped their gun behind their back. Then they took a deep breath and rang the doorbell. A moment later, the door opened, and the killer clown saw Marlene standing there. The killer gave a huge clown smile and handed Marlene the flowers and balloons. Marlene beamed and said, oh, how pretty, and then began looking through the flowers for a card to see who sent it. And it was at this point that the killer clown quickly swung their arm out from behind their back, they raised their gun up, aimed it at Marlene's head, and fired. The bullet tore through Marlene's head, and she crumpled to the floor. Screams came from inside the house, and the killer turned and ran back towards their Chrysler. Once they were inside, they hit the gas and sped off. But not long after that, they heard a car racing down the street behind them. The killer glanced in the rearview mirror and saw somebody was in pursuit. So the killer turned off Marlene's street and sped through the neighborhood and lost whoever was following them in the process. Once they were sure they were not being tailed anymore, the killer made their way across town and parked the LeBaron in a grocery store parking lot. Then they got into another car that they had stashed there and they drove off. Not long after that, the killer was back at home washing off all their makeup. The killer knew Marlene's husband, Michael, would get the news about his wife soon and he would be very upset. But the killer just didn't worry too much about that. Now that she had gotten Marlene out of the way, all she had to do was divorce her own husband, and soon she and Michael could be together forever without having to hide it. Sheila Keen, Michael's young, pretty employee who Marlene's mother-in-law had specifically warned Marlene about, murdered Marlene. It turned out that Sheila and Michael had been having an affair. They had done their best to hide it from Marlene and Sheila's husband, but Sheila had grown tired of not being able to live the life she wanted with the man she loved. So she disguised herself as a clown to hide her identity and killed her romantic rival. Early on in Detective Harrison's investigation, so the initial investigation, he had believed he was looking for a man because of descriptions he had gotten from witnesses. But the large clown costume and thick white makeup had made it basically impossible for anyone to actually get a good look at the shooter, so no one really knew if it was a man or a woman. It was just this running assumption that it had to be a man. But eventually, Detective Harrison had stopped thinking about the various descriptions he had gotten from witnesses because he basically thought they were not reliable, and instead, he had begun to consider Sheila as a major suspect because he was almost certain she and Michael were having an affair. But there simply wasn't enough evidence at the time to credibly tie Sheila to the murder, so the case had gone cold. Decades later, when the sheriff's department reopened the case, they discovered that Michael was remarried to this blonde woman named Debbie. But when police tracked down the couple's marriage certificate, they learned that blonde-haired Debbie was actually brown-haired Sheila. Michael and Sheila had married just a few years after Michael had gotten out of prison. And so this was obviously a huge red flag for investigators. It took a while, but they eventually met with that former Purple Cow employee in Tennessee, and he would say that one night, Sheila, who he knew as Debbie, had gotten totally drunk and told his friend that she had once dressed up as a clown and killed a woman in Florida. And not long after that, investigators found that infamous photo of Sheila working at the Purple Cow drive through wearing clown makeup. And so investigators were convinced Sheila had to be Marlene's killer, and soon the FBI confirmed that she was. They ran new tests on the brown hair that had been found in the Chrysler LeBaron, and they were able to match that hair to Sheila's hair. And so in September of 2017, over 27 years after Marlene's murder, investigators tracked Sheila down and put her under arrest. In April of 2023, Sheila pleaded guilty to second-degree murder. She was sentenced to 12 years in prison, but she could get out as early as the summer of 2024. Some of the investigators involved still suspect that Michael must have played a role in this murder, but there was no evidence found that linked him to the crime, and so he was never charged. Michael also maintains that despite Sheila's plea deal, she is innocent and was wrongfully accused. John Jones and his family were avid spelunkers, which is a term given to people who explore underground caves. In November of 2009, 26-year-old John was back home in Utah celebrating Thanksgiving with his family. 
During his visit, someone in his family suggested they go cave exploring like old times as a way to kind of reconnect. And so John, along with his younger brother, Josh, who was 23 at the time, and nine other friends and family got together and headed off to Nutty Putty Cave, which was a very popular spelunking location in their area that no one in his family had actually explored. On November 24, 2009, around 8 p.m., John and his brother, along with the rest of their friends and family, enter Nutty Putty Cave, and they make their way to the section called the Big Slide. It was not particularly challenging, and John, even though he had not been cave exploring in a really long time, felt like he could do something more difficult. So he and his brother decide to split off from the main group and make their way over to the most challenging section of the cave known as the birth canal. So John and Josh start making their way over towards that section of the cave. They have a map and they're kind of trying to follow as best as they can. And John, who was leading the pair, stops when he gets to this waist-high hole in the wall that he believes is the entrance to the birth canal. When John was growing up and he used to go cave exploring with his family, he was much smaller. He was a kid. Now he's a grown man. He's six foot, over 200 pounds, but he still had the mindset of when he was a kid. And so like a child, he sees this hole and literally goes head first into it without any second thoughts. So John begins painstakingly inching his way down this tunnel that's completely tight on his body. His arms are pinned under his body and with every movement he's making, he's getting tighter and tighter, but he's convinced that this is the birth canal and that it just takes certain people that are brave enough to push past that discomfort, that claustrophobia, that if you just push past this tight section, you'll get to a place where it opens up. So John, believing this is the birth canal, kept going farther and farther into this tunnel until he's completely wedged. He has a little bit of tunnel still in front of him that actually kind of bends down in front of him. And he thinks, man, that's it. I just gotta go all the way down there and I can get into that opening. And so he's caught up against a lip of rock that's underneath his ribs. And so in order to get past it, he breathes all of the air out of his lungs and he pushes himself just past the lip. And then he breathes in again and his chest expands and his rib cage is literally caught up on that lip because he's now moved past it. He can't bring himself back over the lip. And what's worse is as soon as he got over that little lip, he got a better view into this hole he was going down and it dead ends. It just gets to a point. There was nothing there. It was not the birth canal. It was an unmarked tunnel somewhere in this cave. So he's trapped and he knows it. And to make matters even worse, John was almost completely upside down. John yells to his brother and says he's stuck. Josh starts going down this tunnel and he almost immediately gets stuck. And from where he is, he can barely see his brother who's way down this tiny little tunnel. And he knows that if he's stuck up here, his brother's really stuck. This is a very, very bad situation they're in. So Josh barely gets himself out of this tunnel and he yells to John that he's gonna go get help. But it would take three and a half hours for the first rescue worker to arrive on scene because they are way down into this cave. This is not an easy to access area. Susie Matola was the first rescue person and when she arrived, she said, hey John, how you doing down there? And Susie would say that John sounded very distant and he just said, hi Susie, thanks for coming, but I really, really want to get out. Susie immediately reassured John that she will have him out in no time, everything's gonna be just fine. But when Susie looked down into this tiny little space that John was stuck in, she thought this is gonna take a really long time to get him out. I mean, just to set up a pulley system to try to pull him out is gonna take a long time. And then inching a six foot, 200 pound man out of this tiny space, that's gonna take hours and maybe even days. But unfortunately, John didn't have the time. The human body is designed to be upright with gravity helping your heart pump blood to the rest of your body. When you're inverted, blood pools in your brain and your heart cannot work fast or hard enough to get it out in time. And so it eventually causes your body to shut down. So when the trauma physician saw that John was inverted and he had already been there for three and a half hours before rescuers even got to him, he told Susie and the rest of the rescuers that John maybe has eight to 10 hours left to live. The rescuers tried everything to try to get John out of the cave. They put a rope around his legs and tried yanking him out, didn't work. They set up an elaborate pulley system. It barely worked, but they kept falling out of the wall. And so it was taking all this time just to get set up only to move him a fraction of an inch. They got drills and chisels and they went down into the tunnel and began trying to chisel John out. 
but again, it was almost negligible progress and it was just taking too much time. As the rescuers are doing everything they can to try to get him out, they noticed that John's breathing was becoming labored and his voice sounded nasally, indicating that more and more fluid was building up now inside of his lungs and that probably they were within the last few hours that he was gonna be alive. At some point, they finally got John to move just a couple of inches using this really elaborate pulley system that they had found a way to stay anchored in the walls, but they saw there was a huge problem. No matter what system they were gonna use to get John out of this hole, due to the angle of the cave he had crawled into, his legs would not fit. They would not bend in the right direction on the way out. They would have to break his legs in order to curve him around this bend in the cave. With John's breathing already labored and him being basically unresponsive at this point, they figured that if they broke his legs, that would just send him into shock and kill him anyways. So they realized that they cannot get John out of this cave. He's going to die here. 27 hours after John had become stuck, he became unresponsive and he was declared dead. The 26-year-old medical student would leave behind his wife as well as their one-year-old daughter, and his wife was due with their second child in June of the following year. Following John's death, Nutty Putty Cave was sealed off with cement, and John's body is still inside Nutty Putty Cave to this day. The next story, which is our number two story on today's list, is called Panic. In the early morning hours of February 6, 2014, a van carrying five men finally came to a stop outside of a farm in Norway. After a miserable nearly 15 hour drive, these five men who were from Finland were finally ready to begin their real adventure. They were going to be attempting one of the most dangerous underwater dives in the world. It is called the Traverse, and it is a two kilometer subsurface dive from one entrance of the Plura Cave to the other. The entrance they were going to start in was inside of the frozen pond next to this farm. Two of the five men had actually done this so-called traverse before because they were the ones that discovered these two entrances were actually connected. But no amount of experience was going to limit the amount of physical risk they would have to take in order to complete this dive. The dive was so long, over two kilometers, that you actually needed a specialized underwater scooter that could propel you through the tunnel because you wouldn't be able to swim fast enough before you ran out of air. Which also meant if your scooter broke down in the middle of this pitch black underwater cave, you were screwed. The majority of the dive was gonna be through this really tight tunnel where all along the ground were these limestone rocks that kind of poked up, where if you weren't careful, if you dragged your dry suit along them, you could tear it open. And then freezing water would go into your dry suit and you would die. Also, they were gonna be using a diving rig known as a rebreather. So as a Navy SEAL, we used rebreathers. Basically, it takes your air and rebreathes it. So you're not breathing air into the water, you're breathing out into the system that scrubs your CO2 and then pumps it back into you. And you also combine that rebreathed air with pure oxygen. So you have a continuous cycle where you're just breathing pure oxygen. It makes for a really cool dive because you're looking around and there's no bubbles, but it's also very dangerous and your body doesn't really adjust well to having pure oxygen pumped into it. In fact, you can be poisoned from pure oxygen. And when you're diving at depth with a rebreather on the way up, you can't just rock it to the surface. There are these things called decompression stops along the way up, where depending on how long you were at a certain depth, you need to wait at certain stops along the way back up to the surface and let your body decompress. If you don't do that and you just rush to the surface, you can get something called the bends, which is decompression sickness, and it can be fatal. Not to mention there's a couple other nasty side effects of using a rebreather, like if you get water inside of your breathing loop, it can actually get into the CO2 absorbent that sits inside of your rig, and that can cause this acidic mixture to go back into your mouth, but you can't take the mouthpiece out because more water will get into it and it'll flood your rig and then you'll just drown. So you need to just accept that there could be acid in your mouth and you need to either get somebody else to give you their mouthpiece or get a standby rig and breathe off of that because there's no solution to this. You just gotta have acid in your mouth. 
Also, if you panic for any reason on a rebreather, you'll be breathing really heavy and your system will not be able to scrub the CO2 fast enough and you'll have a buildup of CO2 in your body and you'll get hypercapnia, which can lead to disorientation and even passing out, which can be lethal underwater. This dive was famously dangerous to the point where the best divers in the world wouldn't attempt it. They called it a death wish. But these five divers from Finland were determined and they were eager to make the traverse. So shortly after they arrive, they take a quick nap and then they get up and they're ready to start the dive. They decided to break up into two groups. They had a pair that was gonna go down first and then two hours later, the other three would follow. Once the first pair was in the water, there would be no way to communicate between the two groups. So the pair cuts a triangle into the ice with a chainsaw. They hop into the beautifully clear water and very quickly they start descending down into this tunnel. Once they got down to the tunnel, they turned on their scooters and started heading out. After a couple of hours, the pair reached the most dangerous part of the dive, where the tunnel basically nose dives and goes straight down to about 130 meters. And as you're going down, you have to be very cautious that you're going the right way because there's all these dead end tunnels that look exactly like the way you're supposed to go. And they go pretty far out, but if you were to accidentally take a wrong turn and go down one of these dead man turns, you wouldn't have enough oxygen to complete the dive. So it's a slow process of making sure you go down the exact right path and then when you get to the bottom at 130 meters, there was this plate that had been left there to signify you've gone the right way. And then you turn and go right back up again and you're pretty much at the exit at that point. But it takes quite a while to cover that last little bit because there are necessary decompression stops along the way. The first group descended with no issues and didn't get sidetracked. They got to the bottom where that plate was. They turned and began going back up the ascent to their first decompression stop. The lead diver got through a particularly tight spot and then noticed that his partner behind him, his flashlight, which was normally right up against him, he couldn't see it anymore. And he turned and he saw that his partner had gotten wedged in this one section of the ascent. So the lead diver turns around and swims down to the trapped diver, who he can tell is panicking a little bit because he's trying to get himself free and he can't move. And the lead diver looks and he can tell that he is thoroughly wedged into this one little section. And the lead diver would say that what he thought happened is the trap diver must have been going too quickly with his scooter and basically motorized himself into this wedge. Like it wouldn't have been humanly possible to swim fast or hard enough to get stuck as badly as he did. The lead diver could tell that he was totally stuck. There was probably no way he was gonna get out of this. And so he tried taking some of his gear off, but they have such little space to work with. And the trap diver is starting to sense that this isn't going very well. And in a panic, he accidentally knocks his mouthpiece out of his mouth and can't find it again and ends up inhaling a bunch of water and he dies. The lead diver knows that he can't panic because he will end up burning through his oxygen. He'll probably get hypercapnia. He won't be able to get to the surface and he'll die too. So he tries to free his friend's body and he can't. And he's now realizing that the second set of divers that are coming in the tunnel, they're gonna get to this point in the dive, which is very far into the dive and they won't be able to get past his dead body. And they'll have to turn around, but they don't have enough oxygen, he didn't think, to make it back to the surface. And so almost certainly, those three divers are gonna get here and be trapped and are gonna die too. And so terrified and devastated and saddened by what's ultimately gonna happen, he turns and starts heading for the surface and he had to stop at each of those decompression stops. And you can only imagine what it was like to be sitting inside of this tight tunnel waiting for 30 minutes and 45 minutes, the different decompression stops, just thinking about what's inevitably going to happen beyond the dead body. They're going to get trapped. They're going to die. He's going to be the only one that gets out of here alive. And at some point he makes it up to the surface and he just sits there and waits. Meanwhile, the second set of divers did enter the water two hours later. They go down to the tunnel, they're making their way out, and they were farther spread out than the pair was. And so the first diver, the lead diver of the second group, he reached the dead body first before the other two had even seen it or knew about it, and he began to panic. And as the second and third diver come up and realize what's happening, they see the lead diver lose his mouthpiece and in a panic, he's moving around like this and he inhales water and also drowns. And so now the second and third diver are dealing with the fact that they just watched their friend die right in front of them. Their other friend from the first group is dead and blocking their way. And the second and third diver, they also begin to panic. They don't communicate and one of them just immediately turns and starts kicking it out back towards the entrance, knowing full well they probably don't have enough oxygen to get there. 
the other diver decided they were going to find a way to get past the dead body that was wedged in the only way up to the surface. And so on their own, over a kilometer underwater in this tight little tunnel where they're totally trapped, they're relying on a flashlight for light, there's two dead bodies, the second diver begins removing pieces of their gear and pushing it through the little space between the dead body and the clearing that he wanted to get to to make his way up to the surface. And after pushing through all of his gear, including his tank, which is a big commitment, because once it was through, he would have to go to the other side. He couldn't get it back through and push himself through painstakingly with his hands all the way through this tiny little space that he could just barely get through. And then he puts his gear back on and then knowing he had almost no oxygen left, he had to basically rock it to the surface and just hope decompression sickness didn't kill him. The other diver who had turned around and gone all the way back to the entrance they skipped all of their decompression stops as well. They got to the entrance just barely, but when they got there, the entrance was frozen over and they had to punch their way through the ice, which they were able to do. And they too got on surface once again. The three survivors linked up, they called authorities, they went to the hospital, they would make a full recovery. They told authorities where their friends were in this cave, but no one had the ability to get down and retrieve their body. So they sealed off both entrances to this cave and called it a gravesite and said no one can go down there. But months later, the three survivors had such intense survivor's guilt that they would actually illegally go back to Plura Cave and retrieve their bodies. The next and final story, which is the top story of today's list, is called The Third Stage. In 1938, a farmer in southeastern Australia decided to bring his horses to a watering hole on the other side of his large property. As he was leading the horses across this big, wide open field, one of his horses suddenly just collapsed to the ground. The farmer ran over to see what was going on, but as soon as he got over to it, the horse had stood back up again and seemed totally unhurt. The farmer was puzzled because he had no idea why the horse fell in the first place, and so he looked down to see if maybe it tripped on something and he saw on the ground right beneath the horse was this small hole. And so he moved his horse out of the way, and then when he came back to look at this thing, he saw it was only maybe a foot across, but when he peered down into it, he saw it was very deep. And so he got down on his hands and knees to get a closer look, and when his eyes adjusted, he could not believe what he was seeing. 10 or 15 feet below the surface was this huge pool of clear water. The horse had just stepped into the roof of an underground cave. And so the farmer was really excited to see how big this cave was. And so he grabbed all his horses and he brought them back to the stable and he got this long measuring rope with a weight at the end of it. So he runs back out to the hole, he puts the weight into the hole and he begins paying out this rope. And so down it goes 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet. It just keeps on going and going until finally the weight hits solid land at 120 feet. And so the farmer is like, wow, this is a huge cave. So he pulls it back up thinking that's the bottom, but in reality, it wasn't. It actually extended down almost 300 additional feet. The farmer and his horse had just accidentally found one of the most beautiful and deadly freshwater caves in the world called the Shaft. The reason it's called the Shaft is because the only way in or out of this underwater cave is through this hole in the middle of this field that this horse created. And it's literally a shaft that goes down 18 feet until it reaches the surface of this massive underground body of water. The opening to this shaft is so narrow that cave divers, they can't get into it with their gear on their backs. So they literally need to be lowered into this cave by themselves, and then their gear is lowered down after them, and they put it on while they're treading water. The solid ground that the farmer's weighted line had touched at 120 feet when he believed he had reached the bottom of the cave, what he had actually touched was the top of something called the rock pile. The rock pile is basically this huge underwater pyramid that looks like a rock pile that sits at the bottom in the middle of this huge underwater cave. And from the top of this rock pile, you can go down it in all different directions, but once you get to the bottom, there's only two tunnels to choose from. There's one that goes west, basically down at an angle, that dead ends at 260 feet. And then on the other side of this underwater pyramid is the eastern tunnel, and that's much more treacherous. It goes down at a more steep angle to 400 feet. 
The few elite divers that have explored the deepest recesses of this cave say there are three distinct stages to it. Stage one is from the surface down to 120 feet, the top of the rock pile. During this stage, the diver swims unobstructed in beautiful clear water with sunlight poking through the hole. It's a very easy section of the cave. And there's a safety line that's anchored from the surface straight down to the top of the rock pile. So you have something to hold on to as you go down and back up. Stage two is where things get a bit dicey. Stage two begins at the top of the rock pile and extends down all the way to the bottom of the westerly tunnel at 260 feet where it dead ends, or down to the 200 foot mark of the easterly tunnel where you come to something called the drop off ledge. And it's quite literally a ledge in the middle of this tunnel where beyond it, there's a fairly steep drop off and it leads down to an area that's so treacherous, it's got its own stage. Starting with stage two and then with stage three, there is no safety line to guide you in the direction you need to go. So you're on your own as soon as you reach the top of the rock pile. And so you make your way down any direction you want down the rock pile until you reach either of these tunnels. And as soon as you go into them, you immediately start to lose visibility because the sunlight cannot penetrate all the way into these tunnels. And so the diver becomes increasingly reliant on their flashlight. As such, they have to be very careful as they navigate down stage two to not bump into the walls because doing so will knock the limestone silt off of the walls. It will create a cloud of it in their face. It will blind them. It's like being in fog where a flashlight can't push through it. And so the diver has to either wait for the silt to clear, which could take a very long time, or they have to swim blind. Also, anyone entering stage two and stage three, they can't breathe regular air out of their tanks. There's too much nitrogen in regular air. The deeper you dive, the more nitrogen your body will absorb. And if you have too much nitrogen in your system, it can give you something called nitrogen narcosis, which is like being really drunk. And in extreme cases, people have been known to take their mouthpiece out and inhale water, believing they're on the surface, or they'll confuse the direction up with the direction down. And to get to the surface, they will swim straight down until it's too late and they can't get back up again. And so divers that are gonna be in stage two or stage three of this cave will breathe a special mix of gases that are low in nitrogen. The final stage of the shaft, stage three, is just from the 200 foot mark of the easterly cave, so that drop off ledge, all the way down to the bottom at 400 feet. This stage is unbelievably dangerous. As soon as you drop off that ledge, all the sunlight goes away. It is pitch black and the tunnel narrows considerably and stays incredibly narrow. In fact, many times divers have to squeeze themselves past sections where the rocks are too close together. And so because you're inherently bumping into the walls all through stage three, you're pretty much guaranteed to be silted out the entire time. At this depth, nitrogen narcosis is virtually guaranteed, even if you're breathing a special low nitrogen mix of gases. And so divers need to be ready to abort the dive at any moment if they feel symptoms coming on. Once the diver has turned around and is making their return trip, but they're still in the third stage section of the cave, they need to be careful of false domes. These are offshoots on the ceiling only in this third stage that look like the way out. And especially when things are silted out and it's dark, you're low on oxygen, you might be panicking. It'd be very easy to confuse these with the way out. But in fact, these false domes are exactly what their name implies. They are false. They are dead ends. They go nowhere. Stage three is reserved exclusively for extremely experienced cave divers who get special permission. In 1973, eight divers got permission to dive the first and second stages of the shaft cave. They did not get permission to dive the third stage of the cave. On May 28th of that year, the eight divers arrived in that big open field near the cave opening and began prepping their gear. Their plan was to dive down all the way to the edge of the drop off ledge. So looking into the third stage, and then once they got there, look around for a minute and then turn around and head back up to the surface. These eight divers were experienced divers, but their experience was all in open water environments. None of them had dove in a cave. And so they were confident divers, but they were a little bit naive. They believed the dive down to the edge of the third stage was going to be fairly routine and would just be simple and fun. But before any of them had even gotten into the water, they had already made a critical mistake. Instead of jamming their bottle with the special low nitrogen mixed gas that they would need since they were going into stage two, and so that's a requirement, instead of doing that, they just jammed their bottles with regular air. 
So they were basically guaranteeing that they would get nitrogen narcosis. But once they had all their gear prepped, they made their way over to the entrance to the shaft, and one by one they were lowered down into the water and their gear would follow, and then once all of them were all jocked up, they grabbed the safety line and they began their descent. It only took about two minutes to get down to the top of the rock pile, and there they spent about five minutes taking pictures of each other before heading down the eastern tunnel. Three of the divers were siblings, Glenn, Stephen, and Christine, who were 25, 22, and 19 respectively. And Glenn remembers after they made their way all the way down the eastern tunnel and they reached the drop-off ledge, he remembers seeing his sister, his brother, and all the other divers. Everyone seemed just fine. Everyone's just looking over this ledge. They're taking turns kind of peering down into this black abyss that is stage three. And then after five minutes or so, Glenn looked at his gauge and he saw his air was getting fairly low. Not emergency situation, but it was time to leave. And everybody else had the same amount of air as he did. And so everybody else was running low on air. And so Glenn was about to grab his sister who was several feet right in front of him. She was still looking over the ledge down into stage three. But when he reached out to grab her, she and all the other divers just suddenly jumped forward and dove straight down into the abyss out of sight. They dove into the stage three section. This was not something that Glenn was tracking anybody doing. This was not something anyone said they were going to do. This was not part of the dive. This was very dangerous and they weren't allowed to go down there. And so Glenn immediately swam down after them to try to grab his sister and stop her or grab his brother or grab any of them. But as soon as he went over that ledge, he saw it was totally pitch black and it was completely silted out from all these divers suddenly launching over the edge. And so Glenn knows he's not gonna find them in the silt. It's also very dangerous for him alone to just dive down there. And so he figures, you know what? I'm sure they're fine. They probably planned this out and they're just gonna go down a little ways and they'll come back up again. And so I'll just go to the rock pile and wait for them. And so Glenn turns around and he goes up back over the drop off ledge. He makes his way to the rock pile and he just sits there facing the Eastern tunnel waiting for his brother, his sister, and the other divers to come back out again. But they don't. And finally, his air gauge gets so low that he literally has to go to the surface. And he's thinking to himself, if my air is this low, what are they doing down there? 24-year-old Larry Reynolds was one of the divers that went with Glenn's sister and brother and the other two divers into this forbidden third stage section of the cave. Although he doesn't say this, it sounded like he and the others just wanted to go a little ways into this off-limit section, check it out, and then turn around and go back to the surface. And so Larry would say, as soon as they went over the ledge and they're in this third stage, it went completely pitch black and the tunnel immediately constricted dramatically. And so as they're going down this very tight and pitch black tunnel, they reach a section that's so tight, they're down on their stomachs, literally pulling themselves through. And so after a few minutes of the group forcing themselves into this unbelievably dangerous place, it's like they all collectively realized, this is a terrible idea, we need to turn back. And so as they all began turning around, they realized their return trip, just back up to the drop off ledge, which was only maybe 25 feet, was completely silted out. And so Larry is in the back of this return trip line and right in front of him is Christine. And so as soon as they all make their way into the silt, the only thing Larry can see with his flashlight is Christine's fins. And so he's staying right up on her and keeping his light on that fin to make sure he's going in the right direction. And so after only a few moments, Christine's fins just suddenly disappear. And so Larry's thinking, I don't know where she went, but I don't have enough time. I have almost no air. And so he just keeps on swimming, believing he's going the right way. And sure enough, he clears out of the silt and he goes up and back over the drop off ledge and he shines his light back up the eastern tunnel, back up towards the rock pile, expecting to see Christine and the other divers he was just with, but he's looking and there's no one there. There's no silt, it's totally clear, and there's not one diver in front of him. So he looks at his gauge again, and he's got a little bit of air, enough to maybe go down and make sure nobody is still down there. Because he's thinking, I don't think it's possible they could have swam all the way through this tunnel in this space of time. So he turns around, he goes back over the drop-off ledge, back into the silt, and as he's moving very slowly and cautiously, up ahead he sees flashlights moving around on the ceiling of the tunnel. And so he moves down towards this flashing light, and he realizes the light is coming from inside of a false dome right above him. And so he looks up, and he saw there was Christine and another man named Roberts, who was 28, frantically swimming around, shining their lights, looking for the way out, not realizing they're in this dead end. 
And so Larry was about to shine his light to get their attention when Larry's flashlight went out. And so now Larry is in complete darkness. He is completely silted out. He doesn't even know how much air he has left because he can't shine the light on it. And so he's starting to panic. He starts banging on his flashlight and finally the light comes back on. And when it does, he shines it straight up again to try to shine it towards Christine and Roberts. But he had drifted farther down the tunnel. And so by the time he shined his light, he wasn't underneath the false dome. But when he shined his light in the other direction, he saw he was at the very far end of where the group had gone. And so farther down into stage three was clear. There was no silt. And so he shined his light down into the stage three tunnel and way down the tunnel, barely visible. He sees there is one diver with his flashlight out swimming the wrong direction down into oblivion. His name was John. He was 20 years old and he almost certainly had nitrogen narcosis. Larry knew he could not save him. And so Larry turned around and went back into the silt, back up in the direction of the rock pile, touching the ceiling, looking for that entrance into the false dome to try to help Christine and Roberts. But he's not finding it and he's looking at his air gauge and it's getting critically low and he knows if he doesn't go soon, he's gonna die. And so at some point after not finding the entrance to this false dome, he decides he just has to go out and save himself. And so he manages to get out of the silt. He goes up and over the drop off ledge. He gets to the rock pile. He grabs the safety line and he fins himself up to the surface. And when he gets to the surface, he looks around and there's only three other divers up there. One of which is Glenn. And Glenn, he looks visibly panicked and he yells to Larry, hey, have you seen my brother and my sister? Have you seen the others? Are they coming up after you? And Larry looks at him and just shakes his head. He didn't know what to say. He knew they were gone. But for Glenn, this was his baby brother, his baby sister. He had to go back down. And so with the little bit of air he had left, he put his mouthpiece in, he turned around and he dove straight down as fast as he could, staring towards the opening of the Eastern Tunnel, praying that his family members, that his friends are gonna come out of there. But as he's swimming down and he's running out of air, no one was coming out of that tunnel. And so finally, when his air was basically empty, he had to turn around. And on that return trip back to the surface, he realized his siblings and his two friends were gone. It would take 11 months and 11 days to finally locate and recover all four of the bodies inside of the cave. John, the 20 year old who Larry saw swimming in the wrong direction, was found fairly far down the Eastern tunnel laying on a rocky outcropping. Glenn's 22 year old brother, Stephen, was found just 50 feet from the entrance of the shaft, but it's believed he died at a much lower depth and then floated up to that position. Glenn's 19 year old sister, Christine, and the 28 year old man, Roberts, that she was with inside of the false dome were found embracing each other just under the false dome inside of the tunnel. Investigators believe when they were in there, they couldn't find the exit and then realized that they had so little air that even if they found the exit, they would not get out in time. And so knowing they were just minutes away from death, they abandoned looking for the exit and instead just embraced each other while they died. And then afterwards, they floated down and out of the false stone. After this tragedy, the shaft was permanently closed to all divers, but years later, they would reopen it. Thank you for listening to the Mr. Ballin podcast. If you got something out of this episode and you haven't done this already, please offer to take the five star review button out to a beautiful restaurant outside of town. And then when you get there and they get out of your car, tell them you only said you were going to take them there and then drive away. Also, please subscribe to the Mr. Ballin podcast on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. 
This podcast airs every Monday and Thursday morning, but in the meantime, you can always watch one of the hundreds of stories we have posted on our main YouTube channel, which is just called Mr. Ballin. We now have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, and my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crimes. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending to the story for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. My username is just at Mr. Ballin, and I really do read the majority of my DMs. Lastly, we have some really cool merchandise, so head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. So, that's going to do it. I really appreciate your support. Until next time, see ya.